My name is Russell. I uh, just want to, I'm not speaking today, so that's really good for all of y'all who are tired of that. Um, and you only have to hear me to say, hey, I'm glad that you guys have come out here to hear two excellent speakers. I'll get to introduce them individually, but I just kind of want to make a little joke. You're about to see and hear from the most normal looking abolitionist in the world, James Silberman, and the most interesting looking abolitionist in the world, C.R. Cowley. But these are both awesome writers, and we're hoping that they're awesome speakers, but just they're blessing the abolitionist movement. We, we don't know, but they're, they're blessing the abolitionist movement in just mighty ways, just providing people all over the country, probably all over the world, with resources that really sort of articulate our views, the differences between our views and pro-lifers, and the things that we really need to do as Christians who are trying to be biblical in the battle against abortion. So I just wanted to welcome y'all here. Um, and by way of introduction, oh wait, there is something. We are live. Oh, I thought, I've been assuming this has been live streamed this whole time. Never mind, don't live stream. <laughs> if you didn't start it back then, don't start it now, because this is going to be two seconds. Well, this is apparently live. Um, so um, today we are actually filming. We've got two new cameras here so that we can actually begin to produce this material and get it out to a wider audience with high quality stuff. And it was about, what was it, two weeks ago? Two and a half, three weeks ago? We just put out a call through our email and on Facebook and said, hey, we've got a problem. We don't have cameras. We wanna, we wanna make good material. And it was within about 24 hours, you know, we got, what were we asking for? Like, what were we asking for? Like $1,600 to buy a camera. Well, a brother said, I have that camera. And we're like, well, we're already getting donations. <laughs> well, I'll send you that camera. Another brother and sister said, well, I've got a camera that's similar to that camera, and we're not using it, and we don't know why we bought it. We'll send it to you. And we're like, well, that's great, because we really do need two cameras, and we don't have any of the other equipment that we need for audio and studio equipment and all this kind of stuff that we want to do, and that we need to have before the next legislative session starts up so we can produce really quality materials. And people gave, we have everything we need, and so that's awesome. So those of y'all who gave, who are in this room, thank you so much. The, those of y'all that are watching online, thank you. You've blessed us, and the work that we do with Free the States is going to be improved, and you're gonna see that over the coming um, days, weeks, months, and year. Um, and one of the reasons it's going to improve is because we've added James Silberman to the Free the States staff. Staff member, sorry. Um, Free the States, of course, has been run. We've got a board and we've got all the sort of, you know, we're a 501c4 not-for-profit legislative lobbyist group organization. And it's basically been me, the board, and other people. Um, Senator Silk's been very helpful. Pastor Dan Fisher, former Representative Randy Brogdon, and so we we're just sort of building this thing up, and it came time where we're like, you know, our website doesn't really have very much written on it. It's because I can't write. And, um, you know, we don't really have a lot going for us out there in the written. Just at this time, James Silverman was living in Ohio, and he was writing piece after piece for the resurgent and for the Federalist. There were just like these awesome abolitionist perspective articles and people were liking them and sharing them all over Facebook and I'm like well I kind of know this guy I met him out in Seattle and he seems like a really bright guy and he's doing all this work I really wish I wish he was in Oklahoma and we could hire him and he'd do all this work for us he doesn't need to be off working for pro-life organization right and uh, I said God that would be good and God said okay I got gotcha. you I'm just kidding this is a little and then, and then James got fired, and so um, <laughs> that's half true. It, it, I basically was desirous of someone to come on board and help free the states, you know, really buff up our material, our educational material, and our written word stuff. So uh, it just so happened that in the providence of God that James was available. So he's going to come and tell us more about his, himself, his transition from pro-life to abolition, from... Um, where he was to where he is now and what he's up to. So y'all welcome James Silberman. All right, so I'm James. Um, 
I want to talk to you guys um, today, as Russell said, a little bit about me, because I'm new here, and I'd like to, um, like to get uh, to know a lot of you guys and uh, help you guys get to know me. Um, but not just because I like talking about myself or anything like that, but because I've spent uh, the last three years of my life pretty much through, through May um, in the pro-life movement, kind of seeing the things that make them tick, um, what uh, leads them to make certain decisions about legislation and uh, just the direction of their organizations and all that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'll just uh, get started um, with kind of where I was four years ago. Um, I was uh, very intent from the age where I realized that uh, I wasn't going to be an NBA point guard. I was going to be the guy who was covering and writing about and talking about sports. Um, so that was what I was going to do from a very young age, and I was very, uh, very intent on that. And then uh, in the winter of 2015 is when I saw an abortion victim for the first time. And um, once I saw that, it was just sort of like, you know, how do I, how do I go back to writing about, you know, the 2-3 the zone that the Huskies' new coach um, is, is going to implement, right? How, how can I go back to writing about that sort of thing after I've seen, you know, what, what I've just seen? Um, and so at that point, that, that was winter 2015, I just kind of uh, knew that I wanted to fight abortion, didn't know how, didn't know with who, just wanted to go do it. Um, so the first thing I did was I joined uh, my college's Students for Life group. I was going to Whitworth University in Spokane, Washington. Um, and uh, kind of the first thing that came up there um, was a, uh, a friend of mine in, in that Students for Life club um, came, came to the group and said, hey, you know, I've, I've got this community health class, and for this class, um, we have to do service learning. We go to a, some health organization and basically do an internship type thing for class credit. And uh, so she was going through the different organizations that she could do that through, and Planned Parenthood was on there. And um, this was surprising to us. This was a, a small Presbyterian school, um, member of the PCUSA, all of that. And so this was kind of surprising to us. Um, but uh, yeah, I was, I was, you know, I just transitioned kind of from the sports page of the, of the student newspaper to the opinion page. And so I was going to write about, you know, what the school was doing. And so I wrote about that. Um, this was, uh, I think, fall 2016 semester. I, I wrote about how kind of the school um, shouldn't continue. Uh, doing what they were doing with Planned Parenthood. They were, they were bringing Planned Parenthood in to have a booth at the school volunteer fair, at the school career fair. Um, if you guys have been to college recently, I don't know if you've seen those like, things on the wall they have. It's like, have anxiety, call this number, have eating disorder, call this number. Um, in, in the men's dorms, there was always one, one that was blank. And I was always just wondered, what, what is that blank one? Is just everyone is always pulling that one off, or why is that blank? Um, in the process of writing this, I discovered that this Presbyterian school in, in the women's dorms, in the women's locker rooms, that blank one was pregnant, called this number, and it was Planned Parenthood. This is a Presbyterian school. Um, and so, yeah, a lot going on there. I wrote, I wrote this article um, for the Whitworthian, which is a student newspaper, and uh, it became a pretty, like, I knew it was going to be a big deal. Small Christian school, abortion, explosive, kind of everything coming together for a giant, um, a giant kind of collision of, uh, of ideas and worldviews. Um, it really, really blew up, and uh, you know, praise God, it works. Uh, a few months later, this was, you know, this was an article in the in the Spokesman Review. Um, they kind of played off the title of my article, um, but Whitworth ended up not continuing to do that stuff with Planned Parenthood, um, so that was kind of cool. But uh, through this process, um, I became kind of all consumed with 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 abortion. I was before class, I would just talk to my classmates about abortion during class. I would just talk to my classmates about abortion after class when I went home, talking about abortion on, on Facebook, through email, all that stuff. Um, all, all of our Students for Life events got protested. You can see the, the uh, protesters there in the background up on, up on the staircase and stuff. Um, and so this stuff with abortion just kind of became all-consuming of my ability to, to, to get my work done and also just of my desire to get my work done. Um, kind of similarly to how it's, you know, um, you know, why am I writing about sports when this is happening, you know, why am I taking a, a journalism class that I'm not, I don't think I'm learning anything at when I need to be doing this. Um, and so at this point in my life, I basically decided that uh, I was just going to go and fight abortion full time. I didn't know where yet, but I just knew I was going to go do it. Um, and so uh, I, I, I dropped out. That was uh, the end of my junior year um, and uh, started volunteering at Human Life of Washington, which is the, the National Right to Life group. Um, I uh, started volunteering for them, started writing more articles for the Federalist, articles for um, the Family Policy Institute of Washington and all this sort of stuff. Um, and uh, eventually, uh, through, through Facebook, I came across a group that was um, doing 
um, you know, they were they were standing on street corners and um, and on campuses with pictures of, of of abortion victims. And as someone who had just recently been exposed to abortion for the first time um, through through seeing an abortion victim, that was um, that was very. Uh, it seemed like something that was really important to me, um, and that, that's something that not everyone uh, is uh, in in agreement with 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 doing that. But but for me, it was like, how could we how could we not be doing that? Um, and to 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 go and do that um, certainly wasn't like it didn't seem it was not within my realm of of comfort for sure. Um, but uh, it was like, yeah, again, just how, how, how can we not be doing this when this is really what's going on? And so I moved to Columbus, Ohio. This, was, uh, this would have been, um, or no, I went, to, I went for an internship in Columbus, Ohio uh, in the summer of 2017. Uh, that was with a group called Created Equal. Now I spent, um, between going there for the first time in March of, of 2017 um, through this past February, I was there for, for almost two years. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I did, I did a, a lot of stuff in that time. I changed a lot of people's minds about abortion. Um, all of my, my coworkers here um, or there at Created Equal changed a lot of minds on abortion. Um, a, a lot of cool, cool things going on. Um, but just before I moved here was when uh, Russell mentioned it earlier, he, he came to Seattle, a bunch of abolitionists came to Seattle and I had, I'd met them uh, for the first time and kind of heard what they had to say and was kind of processing it um, and all of these things. And so really the whole time I was at Created Equal, I'm kind of wrestling with this. Like, I know, I know this is good. I know these people are good. I know that, why is that moving so much? I don't know. Hopefully it stops. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with this. We're doing good things. Um, but there's this, there's this bill in Ohio that says life begins at conception and we're not going to allow abortion and we're not doing anything. The organization isn't doing anything about it. And so I was kind of saying the, the directors of the organization, hey, we need to be doing something about this. Um, and they kind of said, you know, we're not going to do anything about it. Um, I came back later, said, hey, can we just like put a post on Facebook about it? And they're like, no, I can't put a post on Facebook about it. And so I just kind of, through, throughout the, pretty much all of 2018, it was just a process of coming to grips with the fact that this group of awesome people who were doing some really good things, there was something really, really wrong um, with with the legislation that they were that they were going to be supporting, um, and that was a frustrating thing, um, and that really kind of pushed me more to the abolitionism side, um, just to see that, you know, we, you know, we, we pretty much all know that national right to life is is bad, right? I mean, they're, they're the ones keeping abortion legal, um, but I was still like, well, there are still some pro-life organizations who are doing good things. Like, look at Created Equal, look at look at CBR, some of these groups who are doing good things, um, and then just to see them. Not um, not decide to support a bill that would have that would have ended abortion um, was uh, kind of um, was 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 another kind of eye-opening moment for me where I realized I need to be um, I need to be either pushing for change or I need to be probably doing something else. Um, but at this point, this was like December of last year, so so fairly recently, um, and uh, I came across an article online, and this was at a point where I still kind of, I was like 98% abolitionist, everything I'd seen um, through talking to abolitionists and through uh, my time at Created Equal, I was pretty much there, but I still kind of had like a toe, like maybe the heartbeat bill's not so bad. Like maybe there's some good that can come out of, you know, a dismemberment ban or something. Maybe, you know, maybe the abolitionists aren't all right. Um, that, that was not a thought that I had held strongly, but it was like maybe, maybe it, it might be right. Um, and then I came across... Uh, the website of a guy named Nathaniel Schmolzi. Some of you might know him. Um, I just met him for the first time in Milwaukee a few weeks ago. Really cool guy. Um, but he has an abolitionism website. And uh, I went to his website, and he has an article, or he has an article for each of the five doctrines of abolitionism. And one of the doctrines is immediatism. And in this article that he has on immediatism, there's a quote from a woman named Elizabeth Hyrick. And Hyrick was, was a British abolitionist um, who, who wrote a lot of things um, to kind of help bring about the end of slavery. Um, and I came across this quote specifically um, on Nathan Schmolte's website, and it's kind of kind of a longer quote, um, but I, I want to share it with you because this is really what um, what changed a lot of things for me. So this is a quote from her pamphlet, "Immediate, Not Gradual Abolition." So she writes, "The enemies of slavery have hitherto ruined the abolitionist cause by the senseless cry of gradual emancipation. It is marvelous that the wise and the good should have suffered themselves to have been imposed upon." by this wily artifice of the slaveholder, for with him must the project of gradual emancipation have first originated. 
The slaveholder knew very well that his prey would be secure so long as the abolitionist could be cajoled into a demand for gradual instead of immediate abolition. He knew very well that the contemplation of a gradual emancipation would, be, would beget a gradual indifference to emancipation itself. Um, focus on that line specifically. Um, I think that's one that really, really applies to where we are today. Um, he knew very, the slaveholder knew very well that the contemplation of a gradual emancipation would beget a gradual indifference to emancipation itself. Um, I think when you, when you look at, at, at the pro-life movement, when you, when you look at the church um, at large, um, I think the church is, the, the average American church is positioned on abortion, I think could be described as in, indifference. If you were in the, in, in the pews at the average American church, you're not going to hear about abortion from the pulpit. Um, if you mention it to, to, to your friends in the foyer or whatever, they're going like, to not want to talk to you about it. Um, and I think a big part of that is because the church has never been rallied around a call to immediately abolish abortion until, until very recently, right? The call has been, well, let's, 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 let's uh, make sure that abortion can't be performed with this instrument or that sort of thing. And how can a church rally around something like that? Um, is, that a, is that a righteous law? Is that a just law? Is that something the church not even can rally around, but is that something the church should be rallying around? Um, and so there has n never really been a call until recently for abortion to be abolished. Instead, that it should be just gradually regulated slightly more heavily over time. Um, and that's caused the gradual um, indifference to, to the abolition of abortion itself. So anyways, on with the quote. He knew very well that even the wise and the good may by habit and familiarity be brought to endure and tolerate almost anything. He knew very well that the faithful delineation of the horrors of West Indian slavery would produce such a general insurrection of sympathetic and indignant feeling, such abhorrence of the oppressor, such compassion for the oppressed, as much soon have been fatal to the whole system. Our example might have spread from kingdom to kingdom, from continent to continent, and the slave trade and slavery might by this time have been abolished all the world over. A sacrifice of a sweet savior might have ascended to the great parent of the universe, his kingdom come, and his will thus far have been done on earth as it is in heaven. But this gradual abolition has been the grand marplot of human virtue and happiness. The very masterpiece of satanic policy by converting the cry for immediate into gradual emancipation, the prince of slaveholders transformed himself with astonishing dexterity into an angel of light and thereby deceived very elect. He saw very clearly that if public justice and humanity, especially if Christian justice and humanity, could be brought to demand only a gradual extermination of the enormity of the slave system, if they could be brought to acquiesce but for one year or for one month in the slavery of our African brother and robbing him of all the rights of humanity and degrading him to a level with the brutes, that they could imperceptibly be brought to acquiesce in all of this for an unlimited duration. The father of lies deceived not the unwary only, the unsuspecting multitude, but the wise and the good. By the plausibility, the apparent force, the justice, and above all, the humanity of the arguments propounded for gradual emancipation. He is the subtlest of all reasoners, the most ingenious of all sophists, the most eloquent of all declaimers. He, above all, above all other advocates, can make the worse argument appear the better argument. He can most, most effectually pervert the judgment and blind the understanding whilst they seem to be most enlightened and rectified. Thus, by a train of most exquisite reasoning, he has brought the abolitionists to the conclusion that the interests of the poor, degraded, and oppressed slave, as well as that of his master, will be best secured by his remaining in slavery. And so this moment, I no longer had a toe over here. Um, this was a, 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 real, um, a real shift in my understanding happened. Um, and. Uh, this was, like I said, this was, this was December of last year, and this was the moment where I realized I'm going to have to be more, more outspoken about this. I'm going to have to either push for more change at this pro-life organization that I'm at, or I'm going to have to go somewhere that, that is going to support um, the immediate abolition of abortion. Um, and, uh, yeah, so uh, the, the first thing I did when I had this realization is I wrote an article, because that's what I do. And so I wrote an article uh, based on this quote. It was titled, Immediate Not Gradual Abolition of Abortion. And I submitted this to the Federalist, which is where I had been doing all of my writing previously. Um, and I perfected this article. I spent weeks on it. I made sure every line was sharp. I made sure every point was uh, incontrovertible. Um, I spent forever on this thing. And I, I, I thought then, and I still think it's, it's the best article that I've ever written. 
and it got turned down at the Federalist. And so at that point, I realized, okay, I don't think I don't think this is getting turned down um, because you know the writing wasn't as good as the other things I've submitted to the Federalist. I know it is. Um, this is you know this is the Federalist right now isn't ready for ignore the Supreme Court abolish abortion. Um, and so I took that article, I submitted it to a whole bunch of other conservative publications. I submitted Daily Signal um, to Daily Caller uh, to National Review, a whole bunch of places. And the resurgent is where I heard back from. And this was uh, this would have been early February of this year. And um, they uh, they said, you know, we're not looking to, to publish, you know, guest submissions, but we do need staff writers. We were looking to add some more writers, and we think this is good. Um, your reference referred you well, and so if you want to be a staff writer, we'd love to have you as a staff writer. And uh, I had my avenue by which to kind of press more for, for abolition. Um, I submitted, I actually didn't even submit immediate non gradual abolition of abortion for a few more weeks because I spent more time refining it because it was, I just spent so much time on it. I really wanted it to be perfect. Um, but the first article I wrote, I, uh, I published on February 17th, and it was called The Three Pro-Life Men Abortion Legal in Oklahoma. Um, those three men being Tony Lounger, Greg Treat, and Jason Smalley. And um, in that article, I obviously attacked those three men um, as what they were, the men keeping abortion legal in Oklahoma. And uh, specifically, speaking about uh, Tony Lounger, um, you know, one of the arguments that he makes against the abolition of abortion in the Oklahoma Act is that it is going to get rid of all the pro-life regulations that, that they fought so hard, um, that they fought so hard to pass. And, um, right, if there's no abortion, you don't need a law saying you can have an abortion after you wait 72 hours, right? Um, so to, and to, for him to make that argument, he's either really, really, you know, I'm gonna, he's really, really dumb, or he's just not in it for the right reasons. And he, he knows what's right, and he's opposing it anyway. Um, and so I basically explained that. I said he's, he's, either, he's either very dense or he knows better, and he's still opposing the abolition of abortion. And that did not go over well with, uh, with, with, uh, with Mark and Seth, the, uh, the head guys that created Equal. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't the only thing. There was other stuff that caused it. Um, but three days after that article got published, I, I was fired um, from Created Equal. Now, uh, again, that wasn't, the, that wasn't the only reason I was fired. There were other small things, um, but that was, that was a large part of it. Now. Uh, the timing of it all was was really really providential. So some some of you may know Sarah Cleveland. Um, she's been here for some for some events uh, here, or maybe you guys have gone to Milwaukee, or Ohio, and met her uh, in other places. Um, but anyways, about a week before I got fired, uh, she called me and said, "Hey, we're going to New York. We're going to be doing some filming for Babies Are Murdered here. Uh, we're going to be speaking on behalf of some resolutions, and uh, we're going to go to Day of Mourning and just generally do a bunch of abolitionist stuff. Do you want to come along?" And I told her I'd love to, but to get time off from Created Equal, I needed, uh, I needed two weeks advance notice. So I told her, you know, I, I can't come um, this time, but I'd love to go next time. Uh, then a couple days later, I get fired. So, <laughs> hey, Sarah, I no longer need to put two weeks in advance anymore. I can, I can go to New York. Um, and uh, she, was, she was pretty shocked by that. She, she had known Created Equal, and she knew that I was, you know, that there was some friction there. But she, uh, I think she was very surprised by that. Um, but she called Russell, I think, that night. Um, and then Russell called me the next morning. Um, to just talk generally about maybe some projects that, that they might have for me. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, I think the, the idea at that point was that, you know, maybe they'd have some writing projects occasionally that, they'd, that Free the States would send my way. Um, and that was kind of that's where we left it off there. Then I wrote a few more things for the resurgent, a few more abolitionist things about the pro-lifers in Indiana who kept it legal, about, about different abolitionist stuff. Um, and I think about two weeks later, uh, I get an, another, another message from Russell, and uh, it's, you know, it's saying, hey, why don't you come move to Norman and start the Liberator back up again? <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, that was, I didn't need much convincing. I knew that's, that's what I was supposed to be doing. Um, and this is where I was supposed to be doing it. Um, this is, uh, I think, by far the, the closest state. Um, we're really, really close. And, uh, yeah, I, you know, just praying that it'll happen here, but I, I really think it will. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I was excited to come down here and join, um, and join Free the States. And I joined in May, uh, moved here, uh, moved here end of May, moved into my new apartment beginning of June, and uh, yeah, I've been here since. And so that's kind of how I got here. Um, and so what I want to talk a little bit about now is kind of specifically um, what I saw at the different pro-life groups, um, and then even more specifically, why are we the only ones 
um, demanding the end of abortion? Um, why do the pro-life groups not come every February and join us and demand the end of abortion? Why do the pro-life publications not cover our efforts to end abortion? Um, basically, why, why are they absent? Where are they? And kind of why, why aren't they here? Um, so that's what I want to talk about for a little bit now. So the, the first thing I want to talk about, or the first, the first reason, um, is, I mean, it's not, it's not really a, a, a bad thing inherently. Um, Mark Harrington, who's the, who's the director at Created Equal, um, he would often talk about um, his time spent with other pro-life leaders, with Monica Miller, uh, Greg Cunningham, Scott Klusendorf. Um, he'd talk especially about the people who he got ar arrested during Operation Rescue with. Um, and when he would talk about them, he would tear up a lot of the time. Um, there is a very, very tight camaraderie um, among the pro-life leaders. And that's, that makes sense. You've been in the trenches with somebody fighting a really emotional battle for a long time. There's going to be a very intense, um, intense sense of camaraderie, a very intense partnership there. And so when you've got that, and then you've got uh, kind of these new group of people who come on the scene and say, hey, you're doing it this way, but you need to be doing it this way. Um, but you've all been doing one thing together for a really long time, a certain way. That's not going to always go over very well. Um, and it hasn't gone over well. If you guys have known uh, kind of the disputes between pro-life and abolitionists, uh, you know that those can, uh, can be heated at times. And so for a pro-life group to, to, to endorse an, a bill of abolition or to come, in, to come to a rally for abolition, um, that can be seen as a slap in the face to, to their friends who they've been doing this for a long time with. Um, and, and a specific example of this was when I was, um, I was at Created Equal and uh, I'd already been told that, you know, that, that we weren't going to spend any resources uh, behind the Life at Conception bill in Ohio. Um, and it was at the point where I was saying, well, hey, let's just, let's just post something on Facebook or let's post something on Facebook about the abolition bill in Idaho or about these different abolition efforts. And um, Seth, the, the, the VP at Created Equal, called me into his room um, and just basically said, hey, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's basically a deal where if, if we do this, if we post about the, this abolition bill in Idaho, um, that might cost us these other, um, these other partnerships that we have with Indiana Right to Life, with Ohio Right to Life. Um, people, we don't want to be seen associating with that bill because the other people associating with that bill are these people, are abolitionists. And um, didn't say that explicit, didn't say explicitly that, um, that, uh, that, that, that those partnerships would be lost, but he very, um, very clearly was, was, uh, was communicating that the reason they weren't going to do it was because of the offense that that would cause to other pro-life groups um, who they want to work with and they want to maintain those relationships. Now, when that thought goes through your head, when, when you're thinking, okay, if we endorse this bill that would end abortion, we're going to lose this partnership, the next thought through your head should be, well, we don't need that partnership. We shouldn't want that partnership. Um, but then once you go down that, once you, once, once you go down that trail, there's no stopping until five-point abolitionism, really. Um, and so uh, there aren't a lot of people who are willing to kind of go down that rabbit trail all the way um, to where it leads. And so, yeah, and so we wouldn't even, uh, we wouldn't even put a post on Facebook um, to support a bill of abolition um, because, again, it causes offense to the other pro-life groups, the other pro-life leaders, their other friends who they've been doing this a long time with, so some of them 30, 40, 46 years. Um, and what we are saying is a slap in the face. It's, you haven't been doing this correctly. Um, and so it's understandable that there would be some hesitance to want to say, okay, we weren't doing this right, but let's do it right now. Um, but there's just such an intense camaraderie that it's, 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 it's traitorous, basically, um, to, to, to do that. And so that's, that's the first reason um, why they don't do it. Uh, the second reason, some of you may have, um, may have seen this term um, used by some abolitionists, and there just becomes a way of, of, of thinking and a way of making decisions when you are an organization. Um, when you're an organization, there's a temptation to make decisions based on what is good for the organization rather than what is good for the cause. Um, and uh, that's something that, that, that every organization can be tempted with. Um, I'll give an example of, of, uh, of it happening at Created Equal. So 
here's something I posted on January 31st. Um, this would have been about three weeks before I got fired. Um, so here's, here's what I said. I said, Texas Governor Greg Abbott announces his emergency session agenda on Tuesday, February 4th. Governor Abbott promised terminally ill teen Jeremiah Thomas that he would do everything he could to abolish abortion in Texas before Jeremiah passed away last August. You can watch the video of the conversation below. The bill to abolish abortion in Texas has been filed, and if Governor Abbott puts it on, excuse me, puts it on his emergency session agenda, Texas will be one step away from ending abortion. Governor Abbott is one of the most popular governors in the country. It would be very hard for the Texas state legislature to turn him down if he asks for that bill. Here are three super quick and easy things that everyone needs to do. Sign this petition, call Governor Abbott's office, and pray for Governor Abbott to have courage to do the right thing. Um, and then here's the um, video that, uh, that the Texas abolitionists were sharing. It's the video of, of Jeremiah's conversation with Governor Abbott, of Jeremiah talking of um, uh, prior to his passing, um, and of his parents, Rusty and Kendra, talking about Jeremiah, about abortion, about Governor Abbott's res responsibility uh, to, to keep his word to Jeremiah. And so I shared this on January 31st, and um, at the meeting uh, where I got fired, um, Mark had a, had a, a, a list of things uh, printed out of comments I'd made about the heartbeat bill and different things. And uh, one of the things he had printed out was, was this post. And what he told me is that this post was, quote, incongruent, unquote, with Creed Equals Mission. This post, asking Governor Abbott to keep his promise to Jeremiah Thomas, was incongruent with Creed Equals Mission. Um, that was obviously, uh, that, was, that was a pretty shocking thing for me to hear. And, uh, you know, what I just said was incongruent. <laughs> just, I probably just had a look of bewilderment on my face. Um, I don't know exactly what it was, but I just said incongruent. Um, and at this point in, in the meeting, um, and he had already basically told me that I was, uh, and Seth was in the room as well, he had already told me that I was fired. Um, and so we were just kind of talking some things through, trying to come out on good terms. Um, and so I asked, you know, I just asked incongruent. And at this point, Mark, um, Mark lost, uh, he, he lost his school, um, and he got really angry. He, he barred his teeth at me, um, started uh, making accusations, you know, saying I was at Created Equal for, for, for selfish purposes and you know, was making accusations about my character um, and all these sorts of things. And I think it's, it's telling that that happened, that he lost his school after I asked him how this was incongruent. Um, I don't know exactly what was going through his head. I think that he knew he had said something really bad. I think he knew that he had exposed himself. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's why, that's why he responded the way that he did. Um, but anyways, I don't tell that story to, uh, you know, uh, Mark is a, is, a, is a really good guy in a lot of ways. And so I don't tell that story just to, so you guys feel bad for me or do you think less of Mark. I tell it because it's a really, really good example of, an, of, a, of, of a man in charge of an organization thinking, this is incongruent with our mission uh, because, because we're not a part of it. So it's, it's, it, 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 this is the cause. This is the end of abortion. Um, but it's incongruent with our mission. It's not what we're doing to end abortion. Um, and so um, we're going to make our decisions based on the organization and not based on the cause. And this is a really good example of that. So that's why I tell that story. Um, so anyways, the third reason is self-preservation. And this one, is a, it's a bit more nefarious than the first two. Um, and it's hard to, uh, or it's, it's important to be very certain that, that someone really is in it for self-preservation before making this accusation. But there are cases where it just really is that obvious that they're in it for self-preservation. Um, some of you may have seen this video. That's, that's Russell right there. Um, Rusty Thomas was also in this video. And Lindy Silk, the mother of, of, of Senator Joseph Silk, um, is in this video. And they're talking to Tony Lowinger, who is the Oklahomans for Life guy. Uh, he's the VP of National Right to Life. And uh, one of the things, well, first of all, I'll go back a little bit. Um, when I, when I came to Oklahoma in January of 20, 20, 20, 2018, beginning of 2018, uh, during the Dan Fisher campaign, to interview Dan Fisher, and I, I, I published a Q&A with Dan Fisher in The Federalist. Um, and while I was here, this was just after I met the abolitionists in, in Seattle, probably about two months after, and so I'm still kind of new to the ideas and stuff. Um, 
and I come to a, to a Dan Fisher campaign event, and I hear Russell say on stage at the campaign event that Tony Lounger opposes the abolition of abortion uh, because it gets rid of his, his 18 pro-life victories. I walked away from that meeting not believing Russell. <laughs> I, I did not believe there, was, there, was, there were pro-life leaders. Uh, I, just, I couldn't believe that there were pro-life leaders who were just that openly, um, just that, 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 that brazen um, in, their, in their dishonesty. I just I couldn't believe it. And then a few months later, I see this video, and sure enough, we can't pass this bill. It's going to get rid of our, 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 our hard-fought pro-life victories. Um, He's not the only, Lounger's not the only one who says this. This is a graphic that was posted um, by Allen County Right to Life. Allen County is, is uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana area. Um, here's a graphic they posted criticizing uh, the abolition bill that they have in Indiana. And you can see what they say. Uh, House Bill 1097, uh, the, the Protect, Protection to Conception Act, repeals 17 years of statutes regulating and so limiting abortion in Indiana. Adverse court rulings and lengthy litigation could cause this bill to kill more babies than it saves. Now, they've kind of fleshed that idea out in other places, and what they say is that a hostile judge could take the abolition bill, and he could strike down the parts of that bill which abolish abortion, and he could uphold the other parts of that bill which repeal the, the pro-life, the hard-fought pro-life regulations. Um, you know, a judge would have to be pretty... Uh, brazenly an activist to do something like that. Um, but in any case, a judge would not be able to do something like that. Um, here is Oklahoma Senate Bill 13. The provisions, words, phrases, and clauses of this act are declared inseverable. Are declared inseverable. One part of the bill cannot be split from another part of the bill. It's either upheld by a judge in full or it's stricken down by a judge in full. Now, of course, we're not... We're abolitionists. We don't care what the judge says. We're enforcing it no matter what. But we put these clauses in because we know that the pro-lifers are, are going to make that accusation about, about severability. So just to take away that line of attack, we put this in there. Um, and it, a similar clause is also, this is from the, from the Indiana bill, from the Protection and Conception Act. Uh, you can see that that bill also is, is, is non-severable. Now, Joe Pro-Lifer could be forgiven for not knowing that that, that um, a non-severability clause is in these bills. He could be forgiven for not knowing what a non-severability clause is. Tony Lounger and Allen County Right to Life are paid professional lobbyists. They know, they've read the bill. They know these clauses are in the bills. They know what these clauses are. They are lying. There is no other explanation for what they're saying um, about these bills. And so when I see that sort of dishonesty, I become a lot less likely to, um, or I become, uh, it becomes impossible for me to not ascribe certain intentions when they're being that brazenly dishonest to keep abortion legal. Um, I don't think it's, it's about, you know, about, about friendships or whatever. Um, I, think, I think with people who are this openly dishonest, um, I think the reasonable explanation is that they're, they're in it to preserve um, preserve their legacy, their, their 18 pro-life victories, their 17 years of pro-life victories. Um, hey, Josh, can you open the door? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Seven minutes, okay. Um, for, for these people who are being this brazenly dishonest, I think it's fair to assume um, that their motives are not good. Um, and I don't really see another, um, another plausible explanation to it. Um, and so... Um, with, with a lot of pro-life groups, I think, or a lot of pro-life individuals, I think we can start out by just, you know, calling them to see why we need to be demanding the immediate abolition of abortion rather than gradual. Um, and we can start off, you know, we'll start off gently and then, you know, if they keep rejecting the call, you know, get more intense over time. Um, but with people like this, they just have to be marked and exposed for what they are um, because this is really, really um, awful and evil. Um, what they're doing, and so that, this is this is the third reason. It's hard for me to say again. It's it's important to to be sure before you make the accusation that they're in it for self-preservation. It's important to be sure that that's the reason, and that there aren't less nefarious causes for it. Um, but uh, this is a reason why there are pro-life groups who do not support the abolition of abortion. Um, there's there's no doubt about that. So uh, for just the last the last few minutes here. Um, 
these groups on the screen, there's been a lot of hostility between abolitionists and between these groups here on the screen. Um, and I don't know, um, you know, I don't know if, if, this, if this, these videos are, are gonna get to these groups, um, but what I want these groups to know and what um, I want uh, other abolitionists to be communicating to people in these groups and the people who support these groups um, is that they're wanted at our, our rally. We want to be fighting for the abolition of abortion alongside them. We're not gonna compromise. We're, we're not gonna, um, you know, we're not gonna say we'll support your bill if you support ours uh, because their bills aren't worthy of supporting. Um, but we, we want these, these groups to show up. We want live action and life site news covering, covering the rally for abolition, covering the stuff that Joseph Silk is saying about, about abolition, covering the developments there. Um, we want Created Equal having a, a, a road trip team come through Oklahoma prior to the rally to, to, to help get the conversation going about abortion prior to the rally. Uh, we want Life Dynamics and Focus on the Family and Students for Life posting about this on Facebook. Um, it's going to take courage, again, for the reasons I've, I've explained. It's not an easy thing for, for a pro-life group. Again, it's, it's, it's t to some other pro-lifers, it'll be seen as, as betrayal. Um, and it's not going to be easy, but we want, we want to be fighting this alongside you. We don't want to be continue going on these, on these two separate paths. We want to be unified, um, but it's got to be unity around a bill that is just and a bill that is based on observable truth and, and God's word. Um, and so we really, really want that. Uh, to get a little bit more specific, uh, we especially want the, the Oklahoma pro-life groups. So, so some of you guys know the Baptist General Convention of Oklahoma. Um, they, uh, they really got involved this past go-around. Um, so uh, Greg Treat and Tony Lounger uh, and Jason Smalley obviously had a lot of outcry against them after they prevented abolition. Um, and so what they did is they ran to the BGCL and said, hey, we need you guys to, to, to help us regain our credibility, say we're doing the right thing, say these abolitionists or bad, you know, mean, crazy-eyed people. Um, and they went along and, 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 and they did it. And it looks like they're preparing to do it again. They're already putting out information in their publication about um, how abolition is, it's, 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 just a, it's just a stunt and that the Harpy Bill is the actual thing we need to be, you know, we need to get behind it. They're, they're already preparing that. Um, and they're already digging in their heels. Uh, we don't want to go to war with the BGCO. We don't want to have to have to expose them as, as people who are delaying the end of, of abortion. Um, we will if we have to, but we don't want to. And so if there's anyone from the BGCO or who knows BGCO people, um, please share this with them and share with them that, uh, that, that we want them, we want to be fighting abortion in unity with them. Uh, we, we don't want to continue doing, um, you know, have this uh, kind of two different paths like we do right now. Um, Additionally, to the BGCO, same goes for, uh, for Oklahomans, Oklahomans for Life, Tony Lounger, for Greg Treat and Jason Smalley, who took a lot of heat from us, right? We, we, we went after them hard, and rightly so. Um, we would have been in dereliction of our duty if we, if we didn't expose them. Um, but we don't want to keep fighting against them. We want to fight with them. Um, and so um, to them, to people who know them, um, we want to be fighting this in unity with them. Um, and most importantly, Kevin Stitt, uh, because ultimately, whether abortion remains legal or is abolished in Oklahoma, it ultimately comes down on the guy who commands the police to go and shut down the abortion clinics. Um, it ultimately comes down to the guy who signs the actual bill and says, I'm going to enforce this and I'm, I'm going to ignore court rulings. Ultimately, it comes down to him. Um, and so we really need him on board. Um, he hasn't made a lot of public statements. You know, we're kind of that he may have been inv involved in helping to kill the bill kind of from behind the scenes. Um, we hope that's not the case, but we think it might be. Um, but in any case, we really, really want him involved. involved. Um, and there's, there's one other organization that I want to address. Uh, this is the biggest pro-life organization uh, in, uh, in the state of Oklahoma. And that organization is the government of Oklahoma, is the biggest pro-life organization in this state. Uh, the government of Oklahoma is a pro-life organization. Even, even a supermajority of, of, of Democrats in Oklahoma are pro-life. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the fact that, um, that we are a pro-life, our government is literally a pro-life organization and that abortion is still legal should tell you something about what it means to be pro-life. Um, but in any case, 
to all the reps and senators and members of the executive branch and aides and to all of those people. We don't want to keep fighting against you in this. We, we know it's going to take courage. We know it's going to be betrayal to, to your pro-life friends. Um, we know that it's, uh, it can be a hit to your pride uh, to admit that you weren't doing things quite right for a long time. Um, but we really um, don't want to continue having to oppose you in this and having to uh, be the only ones who, who are standing for justice. And so um, if it comes down to it, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of billboards in Oklahoma City that we can, uh, we can have at our disposal if need be, but we do not want that. Uh, we want to be fighting this um, alongside. And as uh, a state that was the most pro-life, something's not right. Oh, yeah. A state that was the most pro-life state for 2015 through 2017 uh, that's now the fourth most pro-life state. Um, this should not be a, a, a difficult ask to get you guys to come over and support us. Um, and, uh, and, and join us in, in demanding the end of abortion. And so um, the main thing I want everyone to take away from this is that um, while it's tense with pro-lifers, it's tense with pro-life leaders, with pro-life organizations, with pro-life individuals, those are tense relationships right now, um, but keep, uh, keep uh, ex exhorting them to support bills that are right and just. Um, we're, we're getting really close here in Oklahoma, and uh, I mean, a, a, a few more converts, a few more brave people who will stand up and be willing to offend, offend their pro-life friends, uh, and, 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 and the blood is going to stop flowing. And uh, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's my talk today.